might be able to put on, please uh, think about joining the Asian American Bar Association as well as our specific committee. Um, and uh, we wanted to let you know that today's uh, panel was in reaction um, to some of the feedback that we got from membership that talked about who let us know that they are very, very interested in doing something about the November 2020 elections, but because of circumstances, including the pandemic and wildfires, weren't really sure what they could do um, and would find it helpful to really hear from some experts about what there is to be done and how they can do it. So we're so pleased to be able to put this panel on by Zoom. Um, and to have an esteemed panel to join us and share their expertise. Um, we're really grateful to Mina Tidu Liu for agreeing to moderate this. I've uh, looked up to Tidi since about 1993 when I first met her. Um, and she has had a long career advancing social justice issues, both domestically and internationally. Tidi has had leadership roles at the Ford Foundation in Beijing, China, and the Asian Law Caucus. She's worked with the State Department as well as the U.S. Agency for International Development. She's been a law professor, and currently she is the Director of International Public Interest Initiatives at the Levin Center at Stanford Law School. Um, and as she says, uh, she is an interested and dedicated citizen. So thank you so much, TD, um, and I'll leave it to you to, uh, to um, to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Mary Jean. It's so lovely to see everybody here today. Um, what we're going to talk about today is what I think is on many of our minds, which is we are facing the most consequential election of our lifetimes. What can each of us do as lawyers, as concerned citizens to help? So I'm going to briefly introduce our three panelists. They all have a lot of experience and we don't have a lot of time. So I'm only going to do the Cliff Notes version. I'm going to introduce them all at once and then I'm going to pose a few questions to them and we hope to definitely have time for a Q&A at the end. So um, we're going to hear from Archie Coley, who's the Executive Director of Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. Archie was previously the Deputy Director also at Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus and um, worked as a counsel on the Judiciary Committee to Representative Howard Berman. Um, Artie is an experienced nonprofit lawyer, manager, and philanthropic advisor with more than 15 years of experience working on issues impacting low income and undocumented immigrants. We're also going to hear from Levert Wing, who's the executive director of the Commonwealth Seminar, a 15 year old nonpartisan organization which has educated and trained over 1,400 leaders and activists in underserved communities. Levert was instrumental in creating the Massachusetts Asian American Commission a permanent entity in Massachusetts state government to represent Asian American interests. Finally, we're also going to hear from Susie Huang, who is an alum of Stanford Law School and a former litigator at Morrison and Forster. Um, Susie lives out her personal mantra of don't complain, do. Since 2016, not content with merely complaining about politics, Susie began organizing and using her experience as a lawyer traveling to the border to offer legal assistance to migrants, to get our government back to the good guys. Susie will share the various ways, big and small, that she has found to mobilize voters and increase engagement. So my first question for each of you is very quickly, in a nutshell, from your perspective, what is at stake in this election? And I'm gonna ask Susie to start us off. Um, great. Thank you, um, TT. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, what's at stake? Um, boy, what's not at stake? Um, every issue that we care about as citizens goes from bad to catastrophic to possibly irreversible if we lose this election. Um, and by this election, I think you all know that it's not just about the White House, um, but critical races down the ballot. We have to hold the House. We have got to take back the Senate, if for no other reason than to restore the integrity of our federal courts. Um, so anyway, back to what's at stake. Critical issues, the functioning of our democracy, our partnerships and our credibility on the world stage. Um, and really what fuels me on a personal level more than anything is our kids and their kids and the healthy planet and the law abiding humanitarian democracy that they deserve. Um, each time my husband and I write a check to help elect Democrats um, and we literally are spending down our kids' inheritance, we remind ourselves, um, actually our daughters remind us that winning this election is 
the best inheritance we can leave them because absolutely everything is on the line. There is no more powerful form of philanthropy right now. Great. Leverett, what's at stake? Yeah, I, I, to, to echo Susie, what, what isn't at stake this year? I, 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 Susie touched upon the courts. Um, you know, so many folks here are, are attorneys. I don't want to, I don't want to belabor that point. You all know about it. I mean, God bless our, our, our BG, God bless Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, but asking her to, to plank or do whatever Zumba classes she's been doing to, for, for another four years might be a little bit much. Um, and, and it's not just the Supreme Court, it's, the, it's, the, it's up and down the, the, the lower courts uh, interpreting our laws. So you name it, civil rights, the right to, to protest peacefully, the military, housing, housing education with, with Betsy, Betsy DeVos, um, the environment, the, the legitimacy of the U.S. Postal Service. Um, you know, it, it's, it's mind boggling just how much is at stake this year. And um, the, the importance and legitimacy of science. Um, I think it was Scientific American just announced its first ever presidential endorsement in, in 175 years that it's been publishing. Um, and, and I'm not usually one who's given to, to hyperbolic rhetoric or wording, but this literally is a life or death election for America, um, both from a COVID-19 perspective, a respecting science um, so, that, so that we can, we can battle this, um, to, to climate change. You know, we're pulling out of international agreements. Um, how does the next president work with the EPA? Um, heart and lung disease because of, of increased emissions um, to, to national security. How does, he, how does he handle or work with or respect the military? Um, you, you name it, this really is a, a life or death election. And uh, I think Joe Biden said back in April that we're in this for the battle for the soul of our nation. And, and I guess whoever you're backing, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to assume who's backing who, but you, know, you probably feel that way. I, I remember watching the interview with the, the guy who took a machete to the baby Trump balloon in Alabama. Um, which is a, a bizarre sentence to say in and of itself, but he took the machete to the baby, baby Trump balloon in Alabama, and he said that this was a battle of good versus evil. And that's how many people on some, uh, so many people on both sides of this race feel. Um, we're going to have a, you know, a visceral, react, visceral reaction to whoever is declared the winner. And I'll, I'll, I'll reference this a bit later, but this is just, I think, this is just the beginning of a long protracted effort to protect our democracy. So that, that, that's what, it, that's what it's, that's at stake for, for me, in my, in my opinion. Thank you. Ardy? Um, well, as someone who leads a uh, 501c3, we don't take positions on candidates. Um, we just say that, but in terms of issues, um, it, I guess I could identify what's particularly at stake for Asian American communities because that's those are the communities that we've been working with. Um, and so we have Southeast Asians um, who have been targeted for deportation by this current administration and um, also just the, the vast attacks on immigrant communities just in general, um, you know, a shutdown of legal immigration, um, just a range of issues. Um, I think you saw that Chinese students were targeted. We're seeing right now increased targeting by the Department of Justice of Chinese scientists um, and prosecutions for visa fraud. Um, and so, uh, you know, like as I speak, there are new um, issues that Asian American communities are dealing with. Um, and in California, I, I will say, you know, I am trying to do scenario planning for the future and we have to, we have to face um, a future where, you know, if there is, I mean, a possibility where this, these administra this administration's policies continue, state and local power becomes so key and important. And so, you know, the, the stakes are not just federal, the stakes are, are state and local. And how do we, I mean, sitting in California, we have been leaders in the country in, in portraying a different vision 
um, for this, you know, for the country and for California. Um, and so there's a lot of stake at in California in terms of reinvestment in communities. We have um, ballot measures, um, you know, uh, schools and communities ballot measure. We have a ballot measure that's trying to roll back criminal justice reform. And for Asian Americans who are interested in and want to be strong allies with black communities, these are, this is like, you know, that's also at stake. It's not just, you know, what, what we care about for our communities, but what we're caring about for, for um, like a state that we want to build. Um, so yeah, let's stop there. Great. So then let's move on to what are you and your organizations focusing on during the next six weeks? Um, Artie, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, so we are busy. Um, we are doing poll monitoring um, in, in California, and so in, in particularly the Bay Area. Um, and so we're ensuring, uh, and we're working hand in hand with election officials to just make sure that as many people and particularly low income communities of color have access to the ballot. And so one of the challenges, I don't know if you all know this data point, but lo historically low income communities of color don't vote by mail. They tend to vote in person. And so knowing that we had to push the state of California and we've been doing this all along, to increase the number of polling places. And as you can imagine with COVID, you know, that's a challenge. So now that we have those, you know, we've pushed as, as, as much as we can, it's a matter of encouraging people not only to um, become poll monitors with us, but also volunteer to be a poll worker, which, you know, poll workers tended to be, I don't know if you saw it in your neighborhood, but older retired people. Those are the people most at risk of, under COVID. So we need like a whole new batch of poll workers. And um, uh, I've given, a, a, my office sent over um, a document with like, with links and contacts. So if you all want to volunteer for any of this stuff, we have links for you to go to. Um, we've just um, started in a, an operation where uh, one of the unfortunate things is that um, voting, uh, Asian Americans, um, voter engagement is very low. So we tend to vote at very low rates. And so um, one of the things that we're testing is, will Asian Americans vote in increasing numbers if they have outreach by other Asian Americans? So culturally competent outreach. So what we did is we identified a set of congressional districts across the country with growing demographic of Asian Americans, and we're tar we're, we've created a get out the vote program targeting those communities. And so if folks want to volunteer for that, there's a link um, and um, we'll be testing, you know, this is kind of the holy grail in political science, like how do you get people out? Um, and for our communities, there's very little outreach by traditional parties, you know, and, and so as we're growing demographically and by 2050 will be 10% of the American population and we are considered the wedge, you know, in many ways when it comes to issues. It'll be both important to continue to educate our communities on issues, which is part of what we do, and but also engage them. Great. Leverett? Sure. Um, the, the Commonwealth Seminar's focus is, as you mentioned, increasing civic engagement in communities of color. Um, our motto is to open the doors of government to everyone. And, and for that 91% of our uh, 1,400 plus grads are from the Black, Latinx, or, or AAPI communities. And, and so our focus this year as it's been pretty much every year, regardless of whether it's a local election, state election, federal election, has been to e increase turnout, uh, increase civic participation and education in these communities. Uh, at the same time, um, we don't wanna be so focused on the here and now, which we all should be this year, especially, um, but we don't wanna be so focused that we missed the opportunity to build for the future. And, and we made a conscious decision this year. Um, um, as, as I mentioned, whoever loses this election, 
will have a absolutely visceral reaction. Uh, they'll be motivated to work harder to take back their country. Similar to the reaction folks I know had after uh, Trump won. Uh, there was increased activism. There was a spike in applications to the Commonwealth Seminar Program. Our, our application pool um, pretty much doubled. Um, and so within these communities we're serving, we've made it a priority to outreach to younger populations, to educate them on the importance of civic engagement and to give them access to the tools that they need to both mobilize uh, and advocate and educate their communities uh, using utilizing our program. Um, we've established partnerships with a number of, of colleges and universities around here, uh, the University of Massachusetts at Boston, uh, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which is uh, the UMass flagship, uh, flagship uh, university, Suffolk University, uh, Bunker Hill Community College, which is the uh, largest community college of the uh, network in Massachusetts. And, and we'll work, we're working with high schools, including Boston Latin School, which is the oldest public school in America. Um, and actually today, uh, if anybody is free at, I think my math is bad, three o'clock your time, um, we're, we're partnering with the city of Boston's uh, Office of Civic Engagement to host a panel to discuss strategies on mobilizing the city's uh, burgeoning millennial population. So if any of you are available in about two and a half hours, uh, we'd love for you to join us. I can share the RSVP link uh, in the chat. Um, so those are our priorities for November uh, b beyond, uh, beyond our, our usual uh, engagement of communities of color. Great, Susie, what are you prioritizing right now? Um, so I am prioritizing uh, getting Democrats elected. I am, unlike um, RT and Leverett, um, nakedly partisan. I'm like, you know, all about um, November is coming and we got to get um, Democrats back in power. Um, I'm not an organization. I'm a, I'm a freelancer. I'm sort of a pro bono political connector of people to democratic candidates and organizations that need help. I put out a monthly email call to action to um, try to cut through what is a lot of clutter and amplify what I just very subjectively see as sort of high leverage ways to help um, in a particular moment. And just generally, TT, you kind of refer to this, but I, I encourage my networks to think of these trying times in the context of a swear jar. Every time they want to swear or wring their hands or rant on social media, you got to put something tangible in the jar, either money or time. Um, you know, we all have our personal issues. My, my, you know, my, my hot buttons are around um, human rights and especially the rights of refugees and asylum seekers um, um, and the rule of law. I kind of dig the constitution. Um, so these are issues that sort of drive why I do political work. Political work is not an end unto itself um, for me. It's just a, a means of getting our values, my values represented in the halls of power and therefore reflected in the policies of our country. But you know, I was well into my 40s before I became politically woke to the fact that elections matter. And if we don't have power, we got nothing or we have worse than nothing, we have the Trump administration. Um, so that's kind of my angle. Great. So I'm gonna ask each panelist, what can all of us on this call do to help? Um, Susie just framed it really nicely in terms of, you know, it's not enough to complain. It's not enough to worry. Um, we need to actually act. So, um, I'm gonna ask each panelist what we can do to get involved. I'm gonna start with Leverett. Sure. Um, there, there are so many ways that, that folks can get involved depending on your time, your experience, your, your comfort level um, and, and whatever group that, you're, that you, you feel comfortable reaching out to or whatever networks that you have. Um, the, the seminar, because we're nonpartisan, is working on helping um, phone bank and text bank, underserved communities, voter registration, GOTV. Um, me personally, both this year and in the past, uh, like Susie, I'm, I'm uh, a hardcore Dem. Um, I am personally working on trying to get a critical mass together uh, to phone bank and text bank Asian Americans in battleground states, 
um, working on creating a critical mass to do a, a, a fundraiser and also fundraising on my own. Um, in terms of how what everybody else can do, there is a wonderful uh, handout from the Asian Law Caucus, um, which I think is going to be in the resources we'll be sharing, uh, which lists uh, so many ways to get, inv get involved. Um, you know, some of the specifics are focused on California, but many of the suggestions are, are applicable everywhere. You know, you know, from first and foremost, making sure you and your family are re re uh, ready and registered to vote, to making sure you know all the different ways available to vote and time frames, timing, uh, to volunteering as a poll worker, to volunteering uh, for election protection efforts in your area, uh, to helping friends and neighbors and commute to the community that you live in uh, with the election process and encouraging voter registration and participation in your neighborhoods and networks. Um, you know, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic document. I, I, I encourage all of you to check it out when, when we share the resources. Um, but you know, in, in keeping with the seminar's theme of, of building for the future, um, I'd also encourage you, you know, I mentioned comfort zones. Uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to push yourself beyond your comfort zone. Um, you know, build your own skill set for the future. If you've never volunteered for a candidate, volunteer for a candidate. If you've never made phone calls or uh, you know, via a phone bank, give it a shot. If, if you've never canvassed, try it um, because you, you, you need to build, we need to build our skill sets for the future because this is not a short-term short -term effort. Um, if you have children, nieces, nephews, uh, even if they're not eligible to vote, um, talk with them when the news comes on or, or if, you, if you feel able to. You now, it doesn't have to be a long talk. It doesn't have to be contentious. You don't have to just sit them down at the dinner table and say, you know, let me, let's have this long talk. Um, it, but, but it's important that the seeds of civic engagement get planted early. And then, you know, then if you can show them the importance of civic engagement um, by, by leading by example, you know, at their schools, in their communities, um, by setting that example and practicing what you preach, we will build that next generation. Um, as I mentioned, we're in this for the long haul, I think. And clearly whatever we can do today is vitally important. But what we do to keep whatever progress we hopefully make this year and, and, in, and in following years will be just as important. Great. Susie? So, yeah, Leverett said it so well. I mean, um, there's, there's so much that you all can do as citizens and as lawyers. There's, there's um, yeah, I know it can almost be just too overwhelming. I guess um, preliminary advice would be, um, you know, the best, the best volunteering is, is the volunteering you will stick with. Um, so what you will really be motivated to do, um, to bring in others, to do day in and day out, you know, it's only six weeks until judgment day. And, um, and so, you know, you really want to think about um, scale and, and what's going to make you want to max out your hours and bring in all the people you can, um, because we're going to need that to win. I mean, we really are. It's an all hands on deck moment. Um, um, you know, as far as like the lowest hanging fruit, you know, use just your voice in your, in your personal sphere. This is so important. You know, Arthi and Leverett have talked about it, but like, this is a really complicated voting year. Um, and not just because of the pandemic, but, you know, for a whole host of reasons, voting this year is a process. It's not an event. So, you know, have your plan. Talk to everybody you know about what you may assume. You know, are you registered? Do you know your five options on how you can cast your vote safely? Um, do you know your deadlines? And vote absolutely as early as you can. Um, so, so talk about that. Talk, talk it up, especially if you know people in the swing states. Um, and, and also just talk about this election because there's so much bad information and we are the messengers of the good information. And it's super important that we, for instance, you know, stop talking about the election being 44 days away or whatever. <laughs> it's here, it's happening, it's now. People can vote now. And in a lot of the battleground states, they are casting their votes now. Um, so again, like don't delay, it's happening now. Um, similarly, like election day isn't just November 3rd for voting purposes, it's also not, election night is not that day for reporting purposes. Like election results are probably not gonna come in that night. They could be days or even weeks later and that's okay. And we need to keep repeating that um, in order to combat what is gonna be an inevitable claim from the other side about you know fraud. 
Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's all about accuracy, not speed. Um, so let's be patient on those results. Um, and then, yeah, um, protect the election. So there's a whole host of things you can do. If you live in a battleground state, as Leverett said, we really need young, healthy people to be poll workers. Um, and we can send out links on how to sign up. As young as 16, you can be a poll worker in many states and you can get paid. If you're not in a swing state, you can make phone calls to recruit poll workers in those states. From your home state, you can do that. You can staff voter protection hotlines. That's what I did yesterday for the state of Wisconsin, and I live in California. But as a lawyer, like, you know, we're pretty quick studies on this kind of stuff, and it's super rewarding work. Um, you can consider traveling, driving to a battleground state if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, Californians can drive to Nevada or Arizona, and um, and you can be either a nonpartisan election watcher, um, and we can put you in touch with those groups, or you can do it for the Democrats and be the eyes and ears of the party, um, reporting in any funny business that you see at the polling locations. Um, it, there's also kind of more heavy lift legal work that can be done as far as like helping to draft templates for pleadings, um, because there's gonna be a lot of litigation um, in and around the, and after this election, um, appearing in court, um, seeking emergency relief in various jurisdictions. Um, so there's no shortage of things to do and we're happy to connect you. Yeah, we will send out a whole list of resources. Um, Artie? And I'll just add, we will, we train people. So, you know, don't worry if you don't know, you know, uh, what to do. There are trainings attached with every, with all of these opportunities. Um, the only other, I mean, they've, <laughs> Leverett and Susie have really just covered the gamut. I will just say I had a personal experience where um, I'm on a WhatsApp group with my cousins, some of whom are immigrants. And, you know, there was this information going out about how South Asians are going to be impacted by the election. And it was clear misinformation. And I had to like, you know, get in there <laughs> and shut it down. But I don't know whether it's WhatsApp or WeChat or all these uh, forums where people in our lives are on these forums and they are getting a lot of misinformation and it is important i can't emphasize enough the easiest thing and the thing that you know won't require any signups is to go back into your families and networks and understand what where people are and what they're understanding about the impact on on our on themselves and and on our communities and um, you can definitely help educate folks in that way um, sometimes it's a difficult conversation but you know I would encourage everyone to have, at least start there and have those conversations. Great. So, um, you know, on a personal level, I've been reflecting a lot on what's at stake is simply our democracy. And, um, you know, as an individual and as, a, and as our family, we've been focused a lot on voter registration, voter mobilization, voter protection. Um, and I think, you know, those are values that we can all get behind as lawyers. Um, I'd be interested to hear from each of you. I mean, obviously the timing of the three windows are different and um, the timing is starting to close a little bit. The window is starting to close a little bit around uh, voter registration versus mobilization and protection. But, um, you know, what are you prioritizing um, kind of a lot among those three planks? And is there a particular um, strategy or organization that you think is doing critical work? You know, whichever plank you think is the most important. I know Susie has a lot of thoughts on this one. <laughs> so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not necessarily intuitive when you think about sort of this, the continuum of the voting process, but actually the, the in-person polling locations, which we think of as like an election day thing, or maybe the week before for early voting, that kind of has to have to be decided now, like mm -hmm. right now. We know there's a poll worker crisis because of the pandemic um, and because you know, most poll workers are over the age of 60 and should not, will not be poll workers. Um, and these um, jurisdictions, these cities and counties have to decide right now how many polling locations they're going to open. 
And that is driven by money and staffing. And so these decisions have to be made. Therefore, we need to know how much capacity there is. Um, so kind of my immediate appeal, like right now, um, and the organizations I'm working with are all about poll worker recruitment, raising money for that and, um, and, and recruiting volunteers. Um, um, because if by next week in most of these battleground cities, they don't have, and at this point they certainly do, they're far short of the headcount they need, they will just close those locations and they can't really reverse that decision. Um, and that is voter suppression, um, or there will just be incredibly long lines, which is also voter suppression. And just, it's terrible for our democracy um, for both sides. So, um, so that's my kind of most time sensitive thing that I'm working on. Right. Um, I guess our, our priority, the, the seminar's priority is uh, voter registration and eventually GOTV. And we're using that as a mechanism to, um, to help train and mobilize the younger folks that I, I, I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a, it's a very good opportunity and a very good tool so that they can go to their most familiar networks, whether it's their family, whether it's their friends, um, school, uh, what, what have you. We, and, and, and if they make mistakes, at least they're just making mistakes in their comfort zone. Or, or in their familiar areas. So it, it's not so consequential that if they make a mistake, then it's, it, it's disastrous. So, they, so we're, trying to, we're trying to give folks the tools um, to help with those. We're also trying to give them the tools um, in terms of our program, we teach folks how to uh, advocate and lobby um, their, their public officials, which is a completely different animal now with, with Zoom because Boston City Hall is closed. Um, the Massachusetts State House is closed. And so it's a completely different animal now. So we're trying to teach folks how to lobby and advocate, how to work with the press and the media, how to work with staff and, and legislative leaders and, and leaders and agencies. And so it goes beyond the voter reg and the, and the GOTV to those additional, to those additional to, uh, uh, tools that they can have in their toolbox. So we are, we're, we're again, we're, going, we're focusing a lot more on um, on, on younger folks and giving them the tools and doing the GOTV and, and, and voter reg. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't choose. We'd work on all three. <laughs> so for us, it's all a priority. And um, I would say, I, I agree, I think poll workers and also poll for us, I think if you have, if people have language skills in particular, mm. Um, you could really put them to use, whether it's being a poll worker, poll monitoring, or phone banking. Um, that would be a, a one you know, additional thing I would point out. Great. Um, something we haven't really talked about is writing a check versus volunteering. You know, sometimes that's the best thing that we can do, given our own time constraints, especially as lawyers. Um, any advice on how to make sure our dollars are having the most impact they can? Um, this this may fly in the face of everything that I'm saying, which is we have to win. We have to win the presidency. We have to win back the White House. We have to win back the Senate and the and the House. But I, I've always had the philosophy that the the most bang for the buck goes to the local candidates and and the state candidates because my X amount of dollars, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm giving 250 or $100. In the grand scheme of things for the Biden campaign, it's less than a drop in the bucket. Um, if, if I'm giving that to a city councilor, um, actually yesterday, we, there were, two days ago, there's a historic announcement here in Boston that uh, Boston City Councilor Michelle Wu is running for mayor. Um, and so the money that I give and I raise for her, um, from a proportional standpoint, we'll have a lot more bang for the buck than if I give that money to, um, to a, a larger statewide or nationwide entity. So um, in, in the, in, at the risk of sounding a little hypocritical in terms of the, the focus for this year, uh, fundraising wise, I've always believed in giving more to local uh, candidates and, and also local organizations, community organizations that are doing that GOTV work, that are giving, doing the voter registration and civic engagement education 
um, to those, those are the folks who are on the ground who can make the most impact because they're face to face and the constituencies are most familiar with them and so they trust them more. So the dollars you give to local candidates, to local organizations, I think um, are, are, are most important. Others want to weigh on that one, Susie? Um, well, I, I mean, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't put in a plug for, um, you know, giving to our federal level candidates, especially at the Senate and House level where our dollars do go further um, than in the presidential race. Um, and there are some races that are just incredibly tight and we can, we can win it. I mean, we absolutely can take back the Senate. Um, but I, I, I um, so a couple things. Um, on, on the presidential, um, I just want to put in a little plug because of the audience on this call um, for joining these organizations where there's either no financial expectation or it's quite minimal. Um, there's, there's women for Biden, there's lawyers for Biden, mm -hmm. there are women lawyers for Biden, <laughs> um, AAPI for Biden. And I was a little cynical about these sort of affinity groups, but I belong to those four and I have really enjoyed them. I mean, aside from my fundraising hat, um, even though they sort of exist to help bring in dollars to the campaign, um, you just learn an awful lot. The speakers are terrific. And, um, you know, I just think it makes us, for those of us who are on that team, better ambassadors um, uh, for the message about what, especially the positive messaging around why Biden Harris and not just why not Trump. Um, so we can, I'll send out links if anybody wants to join those groups. Um, but I, I totally agree with Leverett that, you know, I generally with my dollars favor organizations um, that do the grassroots work in the battleground communities. Um, you know, they are going to keep paying dividends long after this election and also up and down the ballot. Um, you know, they're just doing the right thing. So um, that's what I would say about that. Yeah, and I'll just add as a moderator that um, there are a number of organizations that are um, working in communities in 501c3s and seeking to build power over the long term that are also being very targeted in terms of how they're doing um, voter registration, voter mobilization this time around. And I think those can be really good investments and I will make sure those links are um, in the resource that we send around. Yeah, we just we we just sent out an alert to all our staff, and we've we've trained them already. But um, there are undercover right wing folks who are trying who are engaging with folks, for example, in Wisconsin on the ground, trying to get them to say things. Um, and this is the same organization that targeted Acorn, mm -hmm. um, and which was a nonprofit that you know basically lost its status, um, yeah. and so. There's a lot of um, concern amongst advocates who are those of us who are working on yeah. doing nonpartisan work, yeah. and we're we're being very careful, um, yeah. as we should be. But you know, um, particularly because there are people trying to entice folks yeah. um, to say and do uh, the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. Alrighty. So I think we are now ready for some questions. So. Um, feel free to send questions via chat or to use the Zoom hand raise function. And um, if you use the hand raise function, I'll be able to call on you and we'll be able to hear directly from you, which would be lovely. Um, but if you put something into chat, then we'll make sure it gets asked as well. While we're waiting for questions, um, what about social media? What's an effective way to use social media to get the word out this election cycle? Tweet at 2 a.m. and I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, social media is is a wonderful tool. I think one of the traps we've we've fallen into is is thinking not we as a group, but a, a number of folks have fallen into is, is thinking that once we tweet something, once we've shared something on Facebook or Instagram, that's it. We've done our job. Um, you know, it's, it goes far beyond that. Um, and I think 
I, I don't want to say social media has, has, has made us lazy or anything like that, but it's made it easy enough for us to say, yeah, I've done it. I retweeted. I, you know, I shared it on Facebook. I liked it. Um, and, and it's made it easier for, for folks to say, you know, that's, yeah, that's all I need to do. Um, on the flip side, it has engaged a, a, a completely different um, uh, demographic. It has the potential to engage a different demographic if utilized properly. Um, and that's why, that's one of, I, I probably should have mentioned, that's one of the mechanisms that we're using at the seminar to, to help engage, um, especially the folks who are in the colleges that we're partnering with and the high schools that we're met, partnering with. We're utilizing that uh, quite a bit more uh, to, to help engage and mobilize folks. Right. Not my strong suit, but my um, my middle daughter is 19 and she's actually a, she's got a, this position on the Biden campaign as like a social media ambassador or something like that. And so this is what she does all day long is churn out content. And um, I'm a little bit skeptical of it just for the reasons that Leverett said. Sometimes I feel it's too tempting to think you know, that that equates to real to activism, but you know, it is, it's extremely important messaging and done well and accurately. Um, it's very powerful, especially for those who have large followings. So we have a question about um, what is the time minimum time commitment to be a poll worker? You know, what are you actually signing on for when you volunteer to be a poll worker? Um, so my understanding is, um, and I think it, it varies not just by state, but by county, um, is that it's a long day. Um, if you're doing day of election day, you know, you're there before the polls open and they open early, um, and you're there late into the evening. Some jurisdictions are open to splitting the shifts, especially given the crisis nature of staffing right now. Um, but, um, yeah, it's a long day. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't speak to what it's like during the early voting period, um, but I assume it's not that different. It, it also but election observing is much shorter shifts if you're kind of an outside poll monitor um, and you do not, by the way, have to be a resident of the state or that county um, in, in most places to be an election observer. And those are like three to four hour shifts. And, and to kind of build on what Susie said, it is a long day. It also involves training. Um, you know, they're, you, you, they're, they're going to be, whether it's a day of, it's probably going to be two hours before the polls open, but there, there are days before where I, I remember back when I, I used to do it, um, there, we'd, we'd have to have it a, a few days before and it'd be a few hours long. And then as Susie mentioned, you have to get there before the polls open. I think I got there at six, 30. I was supposed to be there at 6, but I'm just habitually late, so I got there at 6.30. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're there, and then depending on how, how results come in, uh, sometimes you're there until, or how votes are tabulated, sometimes you're there till an hour after, maybe two hours after. So if you can find a place that, sh that splits the shifts, fantastic. If not, then um, you know, be prepared for a, a long day, like Susie mentioned. So we have two questions for Susie. One is on the, what are the five ways to vote that you mentioned? And the other is what are the top critical Senate races? Um, okay. Did I say five? I may have exaggerated, but well, okay, here goes. So, um, <laughs> however many there are. <laughs> okay, there are multiple ways to vote. Let's just say that. Um, so of course, um, nearly everywhere, I think everywhere, you can request a absentee ballot, what is also a vote by mail ballot. Um, in some places you have to make that request and you should make that request right now um, because it takes a while to process. In other states, like in California, it's automatically sent to you. Your absentee ballot will just arrive. Um, so mailing that in, um, which is what a lot of us do, is one way. Um, another good thing to think about is completing your mail-in ballot and not mailing it in, but hand delivering it either to a voting center or a polling place or a drop box. And all three or one of those three likely is an option for you. And it really depends on where you live, but you can just look it up online at your local clerk's office or your supervisor of election 
to see the list of your options for um, mail for delivering your absentee ballot instead of putting it in the in the mail. Um, uh, so I guess that counts as four ways. <laughs> um, and then of course there is voting in person, which um, you know is if you go to a grocery store, you might feel very comfortable doing that. Um, we are highly recommending that you consider in-person voting during the early period before election day. Um, in some states that's, that spans a week, some states it spans two weeks. Um, you have several days before November 3rd where you could go in person and cast your vote. And um, the lines are sure to be a lot shorter if not non-existent. Um, and, and then of course, you know, there's a poll worker who can not tell you how to vote, who to vote for, but sort of guide you if you have questions, which um, helps people who are uncomfortable, you know, completing a ballot on their own at home. Um, and then of course there's voting in person on election day. Um, I think that's at least five. Yes. Oh, and key send it. Yes, key send it. Yes, yes. Um, so I could, there are a couple ways to answer this. There are the, the races that are very close that we are either, you know, it, it, it's a total horse race, but I think more important than that, it's which of those close races need the money because some of those are very well funded, frankly. Um, the Democratic candidate is just in great shape financially. They can't spend all the money they have between now and November 3rd. Um, so in that category of what can we flip and who still needs the money, I'm gonna direct you to look at Alaska, which is Al Gross, actually running as an independent, but will caucus with the Democrats. And running as an independent is a smart thing to do in a state like Alaska, which is just a real rebel state. Um, and um, so Al Gross, um, in Kansas, Barbara Bollier running for the Senate. Um, and in Iowa, Teresa Greenfield. Um, so these are people you may not have heard of in states you may not really ever pay attention to. But a seat is a seat and we just need a majority. So um, those are the three. And I guess the fourth one I just need to mention is Jamie Harrison. God bless him in South Carolina. He just doesn't give up. He's, um, he's just a terrific candidate. And probably, if, you know, if he can't win in South Carolina, like Democrats are not going to have another chance for a generation. Um, and he's going up against Lindsey Graham. So really, what else do you need to know? It's a very tight race, which no one thought it would be. Lindsey Graham, as, as terrible as he is, um, seemed to have a lock on that seat. But, um, but we can do that, and Jamie needs money. And he just had the greatest burn on, on Lindsey Graham. I think it was yesterday. Uh, Graham was, uh, was on him to, uh, to, to release his tax returns, saying, you know, what, what do you have to hide? And then I think he tweeted out, done, now work on Trump. And the and and the and the response on Twitter was off the charts. So he had the he 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 won on Twitter. And if he can if he can follow that up with with GOTV and 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 his uh, and his uh, campaign, I think he'll he'll be in good shape. But yeah, I mean, latest polls I think have it almost statistically deadlocked. I think one poll has it dead even. So that that is closer than, like Susie mentioned, it's closer than anybody thought it would be. So. Wow. So we have a question from someone who's done phone banking and found it frustrating because nobody picks up and is asking, what are other strategies? What about postcard writing? What else is there? So yeah, I'll go, go ahead. ahead. Um, well, I'll just, just say, say it's getting it's getting it's getting a little late for postcard writing, um, especially with the state of the postal service right now. Um, but the, I mean, they they had their value. There were some really great programs, um, really like, like data, like evidence driven programs. Um, so the postcards did well there, there is letter writing that um, is actually time to be quite late. And if you can be part of this program right now in the early weeks of October, I say that is still well worth your time. It's called the big send. And um, it's, it's nonpartisan. Um, the messaging is very short and sweet. And it's just targeted toward infrequent but likely democratic voters in swing districts um in swing states in swing districts and um it's just really data driven really smart program on huge scale nationally so lots of volunteer writers are, are making this 
um, effort to reach 10 million voters. Um, and, um, you know, the, there have been randomized control trials on the Big Send um, letter writing effort um, in past elections that show like something like a one to 4% increase in ballots cast, which, you know, it sounds sort of like not great, but when you think about, okay, 10 million letters were sent, 1% is 100,000 votes. And Trump won by 80,000 votes nationally. So like 1% matters and, um, and it's an easy lift. Like literally your kids could do these letters. There's a super easy template. You just print them off, put, fill them in, put a stamp on them. You pay for the stamp and then um, send them off in, I think it's the third week in October. Right. In our outreach, we are also doing peer-to-peer -peer texting. So we have people's cell numbers. So, um, and there's been some data showing that that is, you know, that has some impact. I think, you know, with every election, we learn more. Mm -hmm. um, as a traditional, you know, somebody who worked on the Hill 20 years ago, nothing beats door to door. And so, and um, obviously, I think it's more effective. It's, it's local people doing door to door. They're, you know, I have colleagues. We, one of our partner organizations is in Georgia, in Atlanta. And, um, you know, they told us that when, when people were sent into Georgia, it was not nearly as effective as their own staff doing the, the door knocking. Um, and so back to Leverett's point about, you know, supporting community orgs that will actually, you know, get out people and will, are, who are engaging in door-to-door, -door, um, I think, um, you know, it's important. Yeah. I want to make sure we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leverett. And I'll, I'll be very quick. And, and to kind of echo Susie's point, it, it is frustrating when you're, when you're phone banking. Um, and, and, but, but, you know, if we're doing it, I think the, the main focus is don't, tr don't get too frustrated because if a hundred of us are doing it in all 50 states, that's 5,000. And if, you know, and, and we convert one person on that day, that's 5,000 around the country. If we do it over 30 days, that's, my math is terrible, 150,000. <laughs> and again, as, as Susie mentioned, Trump, that, that beats the number, that's higher than the number that, that President Trump won by. So, you know, even though it may be frustrating to you, just remember you're doing it in the aggregate. You're part of, hopefully, you're part of a nationwide team that's doing it and every little bit counts. Um, so if, as frustrated as you're getting, just try to keep in mind the larger picture. Terrific. Um, I want to make sure we got to this question because we are a group of lawyers. There are questions about what we can do to volunteer post-election around voter protection. Susie, you had mentioned that people wanted to know what organizations specifically to look up. Um, great, yeah, I'm glad you asked and we will send this out in the follow-up, but um, in a sort of nonpartisan frame, there's the wonderful work done by the, well, a coalition of organizations, but primarily the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law um, and Common Cause, and they have their perennial or every four year election protection project. Um, and they can plug you in depending on your experience and your interest and what state you're in. Um, and then um, the Biden team is, is where you sign up and I'll send around that page. And I, um, I'm really pretty impressed. They are working very closely with each of the democratic parties in the battleground states. So you just fill out a very quick Google form, tell them which states you're interested, you're in or, or willing to travel to, or just wanna work remotely in support of, or maybe you just don't care. So wherever the need is greatest, um, and they will put you in touch. That's how I got connected to the Wisconsin voter protection hotline that I, that I staff. And those were like three hour shifts, um, quick, quick training, and then you do just a little bit of like legal, you know, learning. Um, and yeah, and then you can work the hotline. So those are the two main things is uh, through the Biden campaign and through um, the Lawyers Committee. Terrific. So we are out of time. Um, I think the only way to sum this up is to say that 
you know, there could not be more at stake. And I think what we've heard from each of our panelists is that no matter where, who you are or where you are, there's something you can do. You can volunteer time, you can give money. If you're an extrovert, you can speak to people. If you're an introvert, you can write to people. So we will send out some specific resources, but um, please look out for that. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks to Mary for organizing. Really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists so much uh, for your time. And, um, and we will be getting those resources out to everyone. And hopefully this will, this will give us some momentum forward. And a okay. special thanks to Julia. Julia Pang, yes. you, you did it. She was fantastic. Yes. Thank, thank you so, so yeah. much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and thank Ezra you. for all the tech support. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care.